morning, church. All right, so as I begin, I do want to start with the idea or the thought that we all know context matters. Forgive the dual iPad for a second. Um, so context matters when quoting scripture, and we need context, otherwise the message can be received the wrong way, and us as Bible readers know this very well. And the order of words also matters. Take, for instance, with the use of artificial intelligence. Now, while AI can be used for positive and negative things, it is dependent upon words and context in which the order they're going to be input. So a passage of scripture that I'm going to be mentioning today uh, is Jesus in the temple, and it's a prime example. So if you're a regular Bible reader and know your Gospels, you'll understand that when we say Jesus was flipping over, the ta flipping over tables, this is not the image that should pop up in your head. So this image now lives rent-free in my head. Uh, so in, in the spirit of Justin, I wanted to bring a, a little bit of humor. So... All right, Th this is actually the image you should have in your head, is what Jesus is doing, whipping and flipping, and I'll get to that in a minute. All right. So, many of us know the acronym WWJD and what it stands for. It stands for What Would Jesus Do? Became popular in the United States in the early 1990s among youth groups and sparked nationwide crazes with the wearing of wristbands. Before that, it was a book written in the early 1900s by Charles Sheldon called In His Steps, what would, what would Jesus Do? But the true root is actually from Charles Spurgeon, who used, it, used the phrase, what would Jesus do, several times in a sermon that he gave on June 28, 1891. In the sermon there, he cites the, the source from Thomas Kempis, written in the early 1400s, in Machio Christi, The Imitation of Christ, which was based on Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life which I live, not, I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So while these specific instances in the past where the WWJD concept had cultural significance at this point in time, it still exists, but like many other biblical ideals, it has fallen under a status of subjectivity as opposed to objectivity throughout the number of progressive ideals such as the Bible is obsolete uh, that we read or we talked about last week with Major Kathy, but here we speak from Hebrews 4.12. In contrast to that, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged two sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. Or the ideal of follow your heart. Now this is not biblical. In no way is it part of the gospel unless it is preceded by the word don't at the beginning jesus state at the beginning jesus states in mark 7 21 through 23 for from within out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts adulteries fornications murders thefts covetousness wickedness deceit lewdness an evil eye blasphemy pride foolishness all these evil things come from within and defile a man and the modern ideals are enabled by out-of-context misuses of the second greatest commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine. 39. And this misrepresentation of loving your neighbor as yourself is strengthened by those who refuse to allow themselves to be corrected by immediately being offended under the belief that God made me this way, so I am meant to be this way, instead of believing in God's original design and overcoming sin. So because the world continues to change the hearts of many through shifting progressive ideals, it's imperative for us to understand what Jesus did and said in order to truly act according to the principle of what would Jesus do and imitate Christ in all we say and do. So as I proceed, I'm not going to get into the things that we well, know well, that he was born of a virgin, he taught, he healed, he cast out demons, he was crucified, resurrected, and then told the nations to go about and teaching, teaching in the name of Jesus. But it's what else he did that are also big key moments as we proceed. But understand this is not comprehensive because as John 21, 25 states, and there were many other things that Jesus did, 
which were not written by one, which if they were written one by one, I suppose even the world, it's, the world itself could not contain the books that it would be written. So, first thing Jesus did was study the scriptures. Luke 2, Jesus as a boy had stated from being found in the temple that he used to be about my father's business and grew in wisdom from there. And from there, how many times did Jesus use the phrase, it is written, as he went about? When he was tempted in the, devil, or in the desert by the devil, Matthew 4, verses 4, 7, and 10. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And as we heard in our uh, foundational scripture, how many times did the Pharisees try to, try to trap him? The, 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 Moses, the law of Moses says she is to be stoned. Give to C and he replies with the tax collectors, give to Caesars what is Caesars, or the greatest commandment. Jesus came to fulfill the law. Matthew 7, or Ma I'm sorry, Matthew 5, 17 and 19. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. Whoever therefore breaks one of these, one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now this this means those who minimize the Old Testament laws as an apologetic will face the loss of the reward in the kingdom of heaven, according to the Moody Commentary. Now also in this, Christ is fulfilling the law because we ourselves cannot keep all 613 Mosaic laws on our own, and therefore he is fulfilling the law. What else did Jesus do? As I stated earlier, he whipped and he flipped. Jesus was not tolerant of sin, especially in his father's house. Matthew, Mark, and Luke account of Jesus' flipping over tables stating, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. But John is the only direct gospel account, and in John 2, 15 through 17, he mentions, When he made a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temple. Mind you, this is the money changers that he was whipping. You shall not make my father's house a house of merchandise. It wasn't the sinners in general that he was whipping. It was specifically the money changers. But we don't have money changers on the doorsteps of churches anymore. We have social justice symbols. How do you think Jesus reacts to such social justice symbols that promote sin? Jesus warned us throughout the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is recorded six times stating there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth as a warning to impending judgment. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Another warning. And this, he also continues to state I, will state, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And lawlessness refers back to the Mosaic law that Jesus was fulfilling. And again, in Matthew 24, verses 1 through 13, I'm not reading the whole thing, but he says, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. What else did Jesus do? He rebuked. Matthew 15, 7 through 9. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So here Jesus is citing Isaiah 29, 13, where God is speaking through Isaiah about those in Israel holding more to the religious traditions than the word itself. No different than when Jesus was speaking to these Pharisees. But also in Matthew 16, it states, Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, you are an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Now this comes after Peter had just confessed that Jesus was the son of the most high God, the Christ. And Jesus turns around and says to him, you are Satan. How does that, how does that feel? I, and it's all because Peter was focused more on his desires than the will of God in that moment. And then again, he rebukes throughout the, you know, throughout the gospel, but he spoke in Revelation verses th or chapter 3, verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, so be zealous and repent. 
And we often forget that we're not necessarily called to rebuke those who don't believe. Because not, not all are going to believe and not all will be saved. Proverbs 9, 8 through 10 told, tells us, Do not correct a scoffer lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be wiser still. And rebuking did not stop with Jesus in the scriptures. Paul says in Galatians 2, 11, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Now this was because Peter was being hypocritical and shunning the Gentiles when more religious people showed up. But Paul loved Peter to point out that he was acting outside the will of God. Jo Pastor Joby Martin of Church 1122 states, Does anyone love you enough to point your issue out to you? And Jerry, Pastor Jerry Flowers, in his Therapy Thursday session, When They Push Your Buttons, stated, When truth that is good for your soul, spiritual growth, and healing is presented, being offended will cause for you to dismiss it. Truth sounds like hate to those who hate the truth. What else did Jesus do? He commanded us not to sin. Now the devil cannot cause us to sin. So when the phrase the, phrase the world uses, the devil made me do it, uh-uh. The devil tempted you. And devil, he does it three ways. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh is the desire, or I'm sorry, the lust of eyes is the desire to have. Jesus addresses this in Matthew 5, 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you to have one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Getting to our uh, foundational scripture, the lust of the flesh, the desire to feel, sexual immorality, addiction. Now we already heard that Jesus stated in Mark 7, all that defiles a man, sexual sin in any form was not abolished in Christ's death, let's be clear. And I'm not standing here in judgment, guilty, once upon a time, but I am forgiven. So getting back to our foundational text, the Pharisees brought the woman, yet it takes two to commit adultery. They singled her out and accused her, much like Satan would accuse us individually. And Jesus replies to them, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And this is the first instance in the word that in the modern phrase, don't judge someone else just because they sin differently than you. Verses 10 and 11, when Jesus had raised himself up that no one saw and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, she didn't get up and run from Jesus. That's key one. Key two is Jesus did not affirm her sin. But he also didn't say, get yourself right and come back to me when you're ready. He accepted her right then and there and said, go and sin no more. So this is the gospel. When Christ, rec rec um, excuse me, Christ rescued her, redirected her, but it was up to her to live that transformed life not to be as she was before. The pride of life, the desire to be. Mark 7, 21 through 22, we already heard it. And in Luke 14, 11, Forever, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So, Lest we forget that the pride of life is the very reason that evil exists in the world. When Lucifer was too proud and thought himself better than God. Pastor Tim Ross states, resisting the devil without humbling yourself is difficult. You cannot resist the devil if you are prideful. And Pastor Jerry Flowers says, when we are not hungry for the things of God, it is because we are full of ourselves. I'm going to step aside here for a minute and a little bit of life application on the subject of pride and bring it back around to God. In my line of work, negotiations are a big part of my job. Prices, multi-million dollar contracts, legal terms and conditions, and even some internal negotiations. Now in a negotiation, you need to prepare yourself. You need to know your position, know what you want. Know what you're willing to sacrifice in lieu, of certain to, in lieu of certain terms, 
and a walk away point. But most importantly, you need to know who it is you are negotiating with. Now, I'm, I represent a billion dollar company, but I'm not gonna impose our will and our terms on a multi-million dollar company like General Motors or Ford. So who are we to stand in our ground and negotiate our will against the sovereign God of the universe as if we could domesticate him? We are dust. He created us. So we need to humble ourselves as Christ did. Paul states in one of my favorite verses ever, Philippians 2.8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. What else did Jesus do? He washed feet. John 13, 14. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. The Church Social Dallas, I don't have the pastor, I apologize, but the gentleman stated, he doesn't follow us, we follow him. He only washes the feet of those willing to follow him, which is correct. He didn't wash everybody's feet. Now, in if... In modern culture, if you had watched the Super Bowl, you may have seen a commercial from the group, He Gets Us. Now, this commercial portrayed images of different types of people washing each other's feet, which is as Christ commanded, but it leaves out that context. Are they willing to follow God in that moment, or is it just people washing feet? So again, we need to discern what is right. But in that, whether it was theolo theologically inaccurate or not, it was Christ preached in front of billions of people. What else did Jesus do? He showed vulnerability. Matthew 26, 36 through 38. Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to, him, said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Now this was Jesus' three friends, three closest friends. It wasn't the multitude. It wasn't the 72. It wasn't the 12. It was just three. That's all. That's all he needed. And this also shows the human side of Jesus, that he was sorrowful, and the flesh is weak. So what did he do from there? He prayed, Luke 5, 16. So he often withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. And I encourage you to go back to J Justin's sermon series on John 17, when he spoke of Jesus praying for himself, his, disciple, his disciples, and all believers everywhere. In Luke 22, 41 through 42, and as he has and he ha was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw away, and he knelt down and prayed, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Verses 43 through 44. Then the angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. So what did Jesus do here? He submitted to the will of God. He resisted disobedience to the point of bloodshed, following his command not to sin. I did not find that in any in any theology that I read anywhere, but I bring it to Hebrews 12, 4. Have you not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin? This is what Jesus was doing. He was striving against disobedience in this moment because he was asking for, he was asking God to change his will, asking the Father to change the will, but he did not. Here he relinquished control. Pastor Will Jackson states, as you choose sin, you do not relinquish control. Pastor Joby Martin states, you will bow willingly. You will either bow now willingly or you will bow later in judgment. What else did Jesus do? He takes our place. John 15, 9 through 15. As the Father loved me, I, have, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments... You will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy re may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love knows no one than this, 
than to lay down one's life for his friends. And that's what he did. He laid down his life for his friends. He just got done telling everybody that you are my friends. And he laid down his life for them. So what else did he do? He sets us free. Now in his death, those that accept him, accept God's pardon for our sin that separated us from him. Acceptance is the key here. Now I was listening to another sermon by Pastor Levi Lusco of Fresh Life Church a few weeks ago where he stated in a sermon that a death row pardon was not accepted. That might sound silly that someone on death row doesn't accept being able to continue in life. They chose death. Now, according to U.S. law, acceptance as well as as delivery of a pardon is essential to its validity. If rejected by the person to whom it is tendered, the court will have no power to force it on him. And that's a United States case versus Wilson. So scripturally, when Jesus sets you free, John 8, 31 through 44, again, not reading the whole thing. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word and you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 17. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive except because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells within you and you and will be in you. And then Matthew 11:28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your weary souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So here... As he sets us free, I'm going to move into the epistles. Romans 6, 11 through 14. Likewise, you also reckon. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Now we are either free of sin through Christ, or we are slaves to it. We do not get to have both. We we should not want to have both. In Galatians 5.1, Paul states, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, freedom, by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage, referring to take my yoke upon you, and my bird or my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We need to be armed and fight against the devil's schemes to keep our freedom through our relationship with him. We need to have our yoke upon upon his yoke upon us because we are at war. And if you are in Christ, you are in a battle. James spoke rather well on this a few weeks ago about spiritual warfare and being on the offensive rather than the defensive. Joby Martin stated in his sermon, No Other Gospel, people who do whatever they want are the least free, subject to their own wants and desires. You don't get to claim to be a Christian and tell God what you want to do. He is not your Lord if that is the case. Will Jackson stated, we give God excuses and lean back on grace. Grace is not a get out of jail free card because of modern defense of the war and using the word, my grace is sufficient for you. Yes, it is sufficient, but in our weakness, fleeting enjoyment of sin in which we may choose to live, that's, that's not living free of sin. That's not living in grace. Grace is given and living in Christ is what sets you free. 
So now as we've heard a lot of what Jesus did, let's think about what the world says and does. As long as it's not hurting anyone, right? As long as it's not hurting anyone, what is it to you? Well, it does because it hurts the generations that come after you. God knows my heart. Yeah, he does. He stated as much in Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruits of his doings. And we get back to the follow your heart. Pastor Jerry Flowers states, don't follow your heart, surrender it. Only, ju- only God can judge me. You're right. He will. Read Revelation. Is that honestly what you want? God would not send, one, send someone to hell, or hell does not exist. Jesus referenced the gates of hell in Matthew 16, 18, and again in Matthew 23, 33. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Why do bad things happen to good people, or good people go to heaven? Luke 18, 19, Jesus stated, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. For we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I deserve to be happy. We all deserve death. Every single one of us. We deserve 39 whips with a scourge. We deserve nails driven through our hands and feet. We deserve to be on the cross for three hours, naked and mocked. We deserve the wrath of God. But Christ bore that for us, and that is the good news. Christ is concerned with our holiness, not our happiness. So, how do we apply this? Are we studying scripture, not just reading it? And studying in order to gain wisdom and discern what is of God and what glorifies God and what does not? Are we living and thinking in one one accord with it? That this is the word? Or are we trying to change it to fit our own truths? Or is it the truth. Joby Martin stated in his Deep in podcast, we must be careful not to, we must be careful to impose our culture on scriptures as if we can stand in authority over what it says. Do we love our brothers and sisters in Christ enough to rebuke them lovingly and in turn accept rebuke without getting offended? Don't throw stones. You do not have the right to do so. We need to bear the fruit of the Spirit in everything we say and do. And rebuke with love to ensure that your conduct exhibits the fruit of the Spirit. It's not, you're going to burn for this, it's, hey, you're, you're doing it wrong. Use it as a teaching moment. We're not called to save, to actually save others. They're free to do what they want. But that doesn't mean we affirm or condone what they are doing. Are we forgiving each other's sin against us and washing their feet? Or are we looking at someone's past and continuing to view them in in that light as opposed to them being a new creation? Are we resisting sin to the point of shedding blood? Are we walking by the Spirit as Paul instructed us in Galatians 5.16? Lust of the eyes, are we being good stewards? Are we storing up treasures in heaven and earth in the name of status? Lust of the flesh, are we giving in to our fleshly desires? What or who do you follow on Facebook or Instagram? And why do you follow those things? Are we living prideful, thinking we know ourselves better than God does and trying to negotiate with him? Are we praying and submitting to God's will above that of our own desires? And do the things you say, do, watch, Your positions on hot-button topics, do they align with God's will? Or do they align with the world? Do you sacrifice yourself for the betterment of others? Consider soldiers a true sacrifice, literally putting their lives on the line. I'm not standing here asking you to join the armed forces, but are you serving others in your community? Are we living in the freedom of from sin that the shedding of Christ's blood on the cross has given us? Or are we still slaves to our sin 
living according to the desires of the wicked in our deceitful hearts. In closing, I encourage you to be free. The WWJD concept as stated, stated at the beginning is founded on the book of Galatians and Christ living in us. And if Christ is truly living on, in us, we will live according to God's design, free from sin, the way Christ lived. Because our first thought and prayer would be, what did Jesus do in this situation? What would Jesus do now? So as we prepare to celebrate our Independence Day this week, celebrating our freedom, let's remember what Jesus did and said and truly live free according to the word, not the world. As the praise band sings, Who You Say I Am, I encourage you to sing along in worship. And as you sing, there are WWJD bracelets on the altars to the left and the right in various colors. You're welcome to come pick one up and wear it as a reminder of all the things Jesus said and did as you go. <laughs>